when you're not grounded, what happens is you go off on all kinds of tangents and you let your thoughts just fly all over the place. And it's here and it's there. And then instead of being in the here and now, you're in the there and then. And that can be extraordinarily distressful. And it can actually cause a lot of physical issues. So grounding techniques or self-soothing techniques are just techniques that will help you to get yourself back. Take that deep breath and get yourself back. Full disclosure, I have cancer. I have bone marrow cancer. And I was diagnosed 12 years ago, which was a total, total shock. I live a very, very healthy life. I just started getting rib issues, and I'm, my doctor did a blood test and said, I need you to get to hematologist like right now. And what does that do for you? It makes you explode. You don't know what's going on. And since then, I've been through a lot of different treatments, but what I find is anytime that I start getting into the Oh, you know, what am I going to do? How am I going to do it? You know, I, I don't know about going on. I breathe. I breathe. And it just helps to bring me absolutely right back down. So unhooking for me, uh, it's very, very important because if we don't recognize that we are running on a conditioned loop, caring about what other people have taught us and told us we were supposed to care about without deeply connecting with what matters to us as an individual, it can be incredibly draining. Um, and you find yourself feeling fatigued and probably frustrated because your energy and your time isn't being allocated towards you. It's being busy living someone else's life. So unhooking from the negative thinking, unhooking from the self-criticism gives you a chance to practice empathy towards yourself. At least it gives me a chance to practice empathy and self-compassion towards myself. And that gives me amplified energy to move towards things that I value. So about two weeks ago, I missed a flight and I was really frustrated with myself because it felt like it was avoidable. And I heard all of the self-criticism coming to the surface over all the things that I could have done to have prevented myself from being so inconvenienced. Then, of course, the self-critical thoughts went to how I've inconvenienced other people and how my ride from the airport was going to have to shift their plans to adjust to the new flight that I was going to catch and all the money I was going to have to spend. And I really could have spiraled into feeling like I failed myself. And that's when I realized that I needed to unhook. I needed to take myself out of that spiral, recognize that the behavior of having missed the flight wasn't intentional. Was it avoidable? Absolutely. But did I mean to inconvenience myself? No. So I looked at what I was thinking and I was able to be a little bit more rational with this wasn't a intentional inconvenience towards myself. It's just something that happened. And then I took a step back again and I looked at what I was feeling and it was embarrassment. It was frustration. And I was able to empathize with myself instead of be so judgmental and to be curious over, OK, why do you have to feel embarrassed over having missed the flight? You're not the first person this has happened to. And it might happen again. How can we use this as an experience to help us be more punctual next time and not be in this situation? So just being able to unhook from that spiral that came up gave me a chance to practice what I preach, which is self-compassion. <music> Acting on my values, first things I would say it's to practice self-awareness. Get connected with my belief, with my values, because my belief and values define who I am. And it's going to define the way that I behave with other people and the way that I make decisions in life. First thing we need to do is practice self-awareness. And to be self-aware, we need to be present. We need to be fully in the present moment, in the here and now, and be intentional. What I mean is avoid any distractions and bring the intention back to your heart. And then question who I am, what are those beliefs? Maybe it's family, maybe it's responsibility, maybe it's work. 
you decide what are your values because our values change over the time. So my second advice, the first one, self-awareness. The second will be to introspect, to analyze it. No one times a year, like frequently, because we change based on our circumstances and experiences. Then once you come with your values, we need to know that we have values that we are going to be willing to negotiate. But we are going to have other values that are unnegotiable, that you are not going to trade. Number one. Kindness, the act of kindness, performing kindness, or even being the recipient of kindness feels good. Even though it may be just for a moment or two, it could be a little glass or a whiff of kindness, it feels really good. Now, when we say really good, what does really happen to us? It's number one is that there is a rush of positive endorphin. Right, It kind of feels good inside because it does good to our brain. We feel, hey, that was a good thing. I liked it. And when it does good to our brain, eventually it impacts the rest of our system, the heart, the body, and it reduces stress levels. So kindness is actually in random with stress, and stress is in random with kindness. My granddaughter and I had a conversation, and she said to me, why are so many people bad? Or why are there bad people in the world? And I was responding to her and I said, you know, there are really no bad people in the world. We were all born good, nice, happy, generous. No? And over time, I think we are impacted by the troubles of life. Sadness, sickness, fear, exploitation, people abusing us. So we put all the protective layers around. And... Kindness sometimes appears as if you want to open up, you know, you want to set aside those defense mechanisms and therefore become a bit vulnerable and appear weak to the rest of the world or to the people around you. And thus people hesitate to be kind. That's, that's the answer. That's my thought on why people refrain, restrain from being kind. Though it's an instinctive call from within us, to be kind. So what does making room mean to me? Making room means to be able to slow down, to pause. And when we slow down, we make space between us and the hard emotions that show up. And it gives us an opportunity to reflect back, to observe, to notice what's really happening. So what recently happened with me was my children triggered me. They triggered me because they disturbed me in between something I was doing. I got angry. I got frustrated. So I took a pause. I observed. And that helped me to make the choices that I want to make choice in that situation to help me manage my relationship with my children better. So it's extremely important to practice this tool because it makes us capable to stay calm in the situation it helps us to live by our values of who we really want to be and what results do we want at the end. The challenge that we go through to uh, make space is when we don't give importance to self-care, when we feel guilty that we'll be judged, when we feel guilty that we don't deserve to uh, care for our emotions. We don't deserve to give attention to who we are. It's extremely important for us to practice this, uh, to make better relationships. It helps to reduce anxiety, it helps to reduce stress, and it can also help us in work-life balance. And there is no reason for us to feel guilty, to give importance to ourselves, because it's important to learn how to regulate emotions. And as parents, if we model of who we are, that it uh, we model to manage our emotions, our children would follow the same thing. Engaging is being interactive, is being fully present and in the moment. 
and forgetting about all those little things that are distracting you, what you're going to cook for dinner, who's doing the laundry, who's calling me in five minutes, putting your cell phone down and really focusing and honing in on what's happening in that moment. And when you do that, you find that you're more creative. You find more that you're more comfortable because you can handle what's in front of you in this moment. A really fun thing to do if you want to practice really being engaged and help your kids learn to be engaged is mindfulness and being being present, being aware of what's around you. A great thing to do is take a walk outside. If you can walk in the in the woods or even down the street, listen to the crunch of the leaves, listen to the how the sticks break between your your feet or notice with your eyes the difference between a flower and a leaf. Feel it, possibly smell it or make it into a scavenger hunt. If you're walking down a city street, what are we going to find? How many dogs are we going to find? So you're creating a fun activity where you're using all your senses that are in the present moment. And you'll find not only are you having fun, but you're more lighthearted and you're more engaged. And as a result, you feel better and your kids are learning a good lesson, but also listening better and following instructions. So overall, it's a wonderful tool for you, as well as it feels good. I'm a mother of four children, two of which who are disabled, very disabled. Um, they are non-ambulatory, non-verbal. Um, I have found that as a new mom of a, of a baby, first time mom, um, I didn't know anything about being a mom at all or about um, caring for people with, that are disabled. So I had to reach out and um, ask other people that I that I know uh, that I knew or or um, other parents that were in similar situations as myself and ask them where I can where I could find the resources, therapists, doctors, and anything that that was available to them to help them them thrive. Um, and then I also, because I'm, I, it was very, I was very depressed, you know, I, I was a, a young, brand new mom. Um, and not only did I have to face the challenges of learning to be a mother, I had to learn to be a mother of, of a baby that um, needed ex more help than a, a typical, typical baby. And as, a, as my son grew, got older, I thought that it would he would improve and get better and things would be easier. Little did I know things became more challenging and more difficult as he, as he became older. Um, so it really, it really made a difference um, joining support groups. I, I received a lot of knowledge from other parents and the support groups, um, the clinician that, that ran the support group, um, the therapists, the doctors, and you just, you just educate yourself and you, it just helps you, go on. And that helped me with my stress level, you know, just taking, take, taking action, being proactive, helped me with my stress level. Uh, a concept uh, that I'm a big fan of uh, related to neuroscience is called as positive intelligence, which is, uh, it is basically about using the basics of neuroscience or understanding of the basics of neuroscience to understand how our brain reacts uh, in a stressful situation. And by understanding that, we basically are able to then train our mind in such a way that we can shift from those negative emotions caused by the stressful situation to a more positive state of mind. Now, this is a very, very powerful, uh, you know, concept to learn um, basically the you know when we understand the neuroscience of stress and emotions we basically understand that uh, number one any kind of uncertainty or any kind of situation which is out of the ordinary you know where um, we see that there could be a potential threat our, our mind is actually going to automatically give rise to stress because our brain is wired for certainty, our brain is wired, you know, from the evolutionary perspective, our brain is wired for survival, because that's the most important value for us human beings. And so our brain is actually um, wired to keep us safe, and any any 
situation which is considered as unsafe or relatively unsafe, it is perceived or processed by our brain, the parts of our brain which we call as a survival brain, uh, it is perceived as a threat. And it leads to a, you know, what we call as a stress response. Now, in, in scientific terms, we can use the, the phrases fight, flight, or freeze responses. But they are all actually different ways in which our, our brain basically reacts to stress. Now, any kind of uncertainty or uh, you know, situation which is considered as unsafe may lead to these kind of stress responses. Now, for, for me, for example, this was an extreme kind of uns, you know, uncertain situation. I lived for a long time in Ukraine. My family is Ukrainian. And so I lived through the entire period the last year uh, being caught up in an active war kind of a situation. That was an extreme form of uncertainty. Yeah.